Right, I'm going to get proceedings underway. So let me say to our audience here in South Africa, on the continent of Africa and around the world, and I've already seen hellos from Germany and uh, the United Kingdom. I imagine there are many others. A very warm welcome to this panel discussion as we look at how the commercial lion breeding industry could be phased out. Here in Johannesburg, my name is Jeremy Mags. I will be moderating the session, which we expect is going to take uh, just over an hour. The format, very quickly, I am going to introduce our August speakers. We're going to engage in conversation for around 40 minutes, and then we will take as many questions as we can. I will keep an eagle eye on the screen uh, to uh, take those questions in. Before I introduce you to the speakers, uh, let me give you a little bit of background. A high-level panel that was instigated by South Africa's Minister of the Environment uh, to review policies, legislation, and practices relating to the management, breeding, hunting, trade, and handling of, among others, lions, has now made their recommendations to Minister Barbara Creasy. My understanding is that was just before Christmas last year. What's happened? Well, absolutely nothing at this point. We are now awaiting the minister's decision on these recommendations. So I think it was about four weeks ago, perhaps a little bit longer, we discussed the various problems, the issues, the challenges, the difficulties uh, surrounding South Africa's commercial captive lion breeding industry and the impact on the wild lion population. And if you were with us then, uh, things were fairly stark, things were fairly, uh, uh, fairly impactful, and in many cases, fairly horrifying, as someone who is not as close to the, uh, to the issue as perhaps others are. So tonight, I want to move this a little bit forward. There's nothing worse than having a talk shop and then having another talk shop. Um, so what I want to look at tonight is solutions and steps, albeit small steps, baby steps that we can take, that we can start in order to bring an end to this industry. So I want to introduce you to the panel. First of all, Dr. Peter Caldwell, uh, welcome, a wildlife specialist veterinarian, owner of the Old Chapel Veterinary Clinic here in Johannesburg. I'm also joined by Dr. Jan Schmidt-Berbach in Germany, I understand today, global head of wildlife and animal welfare research at World Animal Protection. Lazanne Cornwall is also with us, co-founder of the Big Cat Sanctuary, Panthera Africa. It's a sanctuary focusing on animal welfare. Ian Michler is with us, the lead character and director of Blood Lions. Dr. Louise Duval, Louise, good to see you, the campaign manager and director of Blood Lions. There's one other panel member that you <laughs> might be aware of if you're looking closely at your screen, but that person's not going to say anything. It's what we call in my media business, empty chairing it. That should be a representative of the breeding industry in South Africa. We've extended an invitation once, twice, I understand, maybe even more. We've had no response. We're empty chairing it. I want this to give you an understanding of how serious the problem is and why dialogue is so important in this particular respect. I think the closer all parties and stakeholders move to this particular issue, the better it will be for everyone. But at this stage, uh, no one from the industry has uh, deemed it fit to join this important discussion. Ian Mickler, good afternoon to you. First of all, I'm going to start with you, and then I'm going to move this question to the various panel members. Um, you've had a long history of researching this industry. Summarize for us why we should be closing it down. And Ian, I think I know you well enough now to say as short, sharp, and succinct as possible, please. Thank you, Jeremy. And to all the fellow panelists and everyone that has joined from around the world. So I think the first point uh, to be very clear about is that because the government may be concerned about what to do, um, or they're concerned that there's no clear path forward on this, it means a do-nothing scenario is not the best way forward. And so I would, first of all, encourage the government to reach out, to reach out to the entire spectrum of stakeholders. And they will find that there are many partners across the spectrum they could call on to assist them 
um, with a path forward to closing this industry down. So I think that's the most, most important point to start off with. For specific reasons, we went through many of those um, in, in the month ago session, and I'm gonna highlight them again because they are very important. Um, the very premise that this industry has tried to use as a justification has been debunked across the spectrum of all the uh, major issues involved. And that's a very strong reason to close it down. Number one, no conservation uh, value whatsoever. The entire recognized conservation community, and I repeat, the entire community has come out strongly against predator breeding and can hunting has having no conservation value. Number two, the tourism industry. These are unethical, irresponsible, and they are practices that are, I mean, or, or activities that are not authentic. So it's been rejected as a, as a, as a tourism activity. Um, and then I think the economic benefits is another strong argument. It's been shown that this industry contributes very little, minuscule amounts. And in fact, some of these so-called sanctuaries could be involved in job destruction. So those are very strong reasons why we should close the industry down. Um, and then I think I'd just like to end that um, it's important also to know that the longer this industry goes on, Jeremy, the more problematic and acrimonious the situation will become. And the numbers speak to this. And I'm going to just, I've just jotted them down here. When I started investigating in the 1990s, there were less than 800 of these predators in cages. In, in the mid 2000s, there were about three and a half thousand. And that was the report I did for then Minister van Skalkweg. When we did bloodlines research, we were looking at about 8,000. And now uh, Lord Ashcroft and his team and others have come up with a figure of close to 12,000. And so if this trend continues and the do nothing scenario continues, the numbers will just get even greater. And this is a word of warning. Finally, the local and global opposition is not going to go away. They have very sound reasons to be opposing these industries. And so if, if nothing is done, the opposition locally and globally will grow. All right, Dr. Louise Duval, let me come to you. Um, Ian makes this out to be an open and shut mm -hmm. case. I wonder why, if he makes such a compelling argument, why, in his words, there is no clear path. Um, in, in no clear path in what may sorry no clear um, no no clear path to shutting this industry mm. down. I think shutting down an industry that has existed for this long is going to be an onerous um, task. It's not an easy one. Um, but one of the things that we didn't manage to talk about last time um, during our panel discussion was actually another issue that Ian hasn't mentioned. And we're all very aware of um, having lived through a year of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And that is actually the, the risks of, um, of zoonotic diseases from this industry as well. And in a piece of research that we have undertaken, um, we've identified a lot of pathogens, 63 in total, 83 different diseases and clinical symptoms associated both wild and captive lions. And I think that is another reason that we need to look very, very hard at this particular industry um, and decide what we want. Um, because these are not just diseases that are potentially uh, harmful to lions and other wildlife um, or domestic animals even, but they're also potentially harmful to human health. Um, so we dug a little bit deeper and there's at least 23 of these infectious diseases that can potentially be transmitted from lions to people. And this is an industry that promotes the very close contact between people and wildlife through tourists, through volunteers hand rearing, the farm staff caring, the taxidermists who are preparing trophies, um, the slaughterhouse staff killing and preparing 
uh, the lines and preparing their bones. So every single person involved in this industry and their communities, we're putting at a potential risk of zoonotic diseases. So I just because I think it's so important, especially considering what we have all been living through worldwide in the last year to add that to the list as well. Mm. So I hope you don't mind, Jeremy, that I actually added that. I'm, I'm glad that you raise it because it adds further urgency uh, to the problem uh, that you have uh, just outlined. What I'm interested in, though, is uh, you've outlined the uh, potential zoonotic diseases. To the best of your knowledge, have any of them ever spread to human beings? That is um, uh, one of the things that we actually don't know. There's definitely the potential. Uh, part of the problem is that all the scientific papers that we did review, not one of them was actually conducted within our captive line breeding industry. So we don't actually know, and maybe Dr. Caldwell could actually sort of add his view here as um, the person who's on the inside and has the sort of the, the knowledge from a veterinarian point of view. But part of the problem is that there is so little information, there's so little transparency coming out of this industry. So every single um, paper that we reviewed um, that was actually dealing with captive wildlife was captive wildlife in uh, zoos and sanctuaries. Um, so not in a commercial setting where welfare is absolutely not a priority um, and uh, also, the, 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 the care, the health care that these animals receive um, is, is sort of limited as well, which actually adds further gravity to the situation. Um, because in those kind of unhygienic, stressful situations is where these pathogens can really thrive. Um, so to be totally honest, we don't know. Um, and so we, we don't know the problem we're dealing with. All right. Lizanne, I'm, I'm going to return to you in just a moment. Perhaps we can mm -hmm. pick up that uh, that thread of the conversation. But uh, Dr. schmidt Burbach, let me bring you into this. You want to understand, and this is something that I know absolutely nothing about, you've been involved in ending bear farming, I read, in Southeast Asia. Do me a favor and draw some comparisons between what you've done there and what might be applied uh, in South Africa. Um, and maybe a starting point is to give us a little bit of context. How serious was the problem of bear farming in the region? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I think it's really important to look um, above the rim and uh, have a look at comparable scenarios across the world where similar industries um, have actually been phased out I are in the process of phasing out. And the complexities of, of um, farming industries require a very strategic approach that factors in various involved stakeholders, opinions and needs, but also a sound understanding of the scale and the infrastructure of the industry, as well as impact on animals and people. There isn't really a silver bullet when it comes to ending these industries. Um, once they have been ingrained industries, it's it's difficult to end them. But like Ian said, if you wait too long, it just gets worse. The best time to act is always now to end this before it, it, it just becomes really difficult. Um, I've been part um, of the work we've done on bear farming, like you said, in, in Asia. And bear farming is, is a very ingrained, very comprehensive industry that keeps about 25,000 bears in uh, tiny farms across China, South Korea, Vietnam, and several other countries. Um, it was established many years ago, again, for a similar purpose to meet demand in the population for bear bile. And um, it was thought that bear farming will provide a much more profitable enterprise than capturing them in the wild. Um, farming bears hasn't stopped capturing bears in the wild, is that um, actually many farms with bears have been supplied by wild bears um, uh, to be to be kept over there. Um, what we learned when we- Jan, can I just interrupt you? What is the perceived value in bear bile? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, there, is, there is a historic value in traditional Chinese medicine um, that attributes several 
um, medical benefits to consuming bare bile or specifically one component in bare bile. Um, but that component can also be created synthetically um, or um, there are herbal alternatives that can be used instead. So the, the use of that component, even if you believe in that medical value, doesn't require keeping bears on farms. Um, nowadays, uh, consumption of bear bile has also become a bit of a luxury issue. Um, a lot of um, high profile people serve it maybe as a, as a business meeting or um, just to show off. Um, but coming back to the sort of solution piece of work and what we learned there, working in across these countries, um, it was important that there isn't a one size fits all solution. Um, you do need to adapt to the local situation, even if it's the same sort of style of industry, every country has a different um, different situation, legal situation, different stakeholders. You need to listen to the stakeholders, listen to the people involved, um, seek out collaboration to end that industry. And you need to be flexible in it. Um, in South Korea, for example, we worked with a local group um, called GKU and the government. And the way we worked was on one end, you work on reducing demand for the product uh, you keep monitoring the trade, but also you, you find an agreement with the actual bear farmers to face this industry out. And the breakthrough where was there that the farmers agreed to receive a compensation in order to sterilize all the bears. And, and that really was the change here. All the bears in South Korea on the farms have now been sterilized. This is the last generation of bears ever over there. And it's an end in sight. In Vietnam, same industry, but we couldn't work with sterilization. That wasn't wasn't feasible over there. So um, we, we looked at ways. Okay, how can we monitor the captive bear population? We uh, used uh, high-tech microchips to implant and keep the government to monitor them for illegal bears coming in, and new born bears would be co uh, confiscated and transferred to sanctuaries. So, I guess in a nutshell. Whether it comes to bear farm industries or lion farming or uh, captive elephants in the tourism industry, mm -hmm. the principal elements for a solution are often very similar. Um, it's about reducing demand. It's about ensuring no new animals enter the industry um, while also working with the farm owners to adjust the businesses away from that exploitation. And lastly, to ensure the best possible solution for that last generation of animals in captivity. And that's a tricky question, obviously, that that option could be meaning welfare improvements on site. It could mean relocation to a sanctuary if available, but it can also in some cases mean euthanasia of the animals if, if that's what needed. It's really hard work. It's challenging decisions to be made. But right. like Ian said, the best time to start ending these industries is now. Always. All right. I, w w one of the issues you've just raised is uh, incentivized compensation. Uh, to all the panel members, think about that, because as we start to explore the, the path forward, I want to test your thoughts on that. But um, Jan, you also raised the issue of transferring predators in the industry to sanctuaries. Lazan Cornwall, come into the conversation. That is firmly in your bailiwick. Is that possible? Is that doable? Could it happen? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, unfortunately, that's not a possibility at all. Uh, we are a handful of true sanctuaries. I like to call them true sanctuaries. Um, that does not breed, does not trade, does not interact. But as far as that goes, space and finances, there is absolutely no way we can relocate 15,000 lions. I think the more realistic approach will be that we need to, like Jan said, we need to improvise on how to create sanctuaries at those breeding facilities. Legislation needs to change. We need to spay females. We need to euthanize the ill and the old and the ones that do not have a quality of life and let the ones that can live out the rest of their lives. Um, that's the only way forward is to create sanctuaries right there where the breeding facilities are. It's a massive undertaking, Lizanne. That's not going to happen, is it? Uh, I want to be positive and I want to believe that there's good enough people in this world that we can make it happen. But the only way we can move forward with this is if legislation changes. We need to get an absolute ban on captive breeding and issuing of any more permits for new farms to, to be able to be created, for trading to happen and for transportation and trading between the different farms. 
So legislation changing that, that's the first step to go before we can even think of starting to create sanctuaries and approaching the different breeders. Dr. Caldwell, you're in the front line of this particular fight. Uh, the general welfare conditions, what have you experienced? Hi, Jeremy and all the panel members. Um, yeah, uh, you see everyone that's uh, spoken this afternoon already, I totally agree with every single aspect, but from a clinical and veterinary perspective, I have to really look at it from an objective point of view. I have to look at it from obviously um, the human and the animal perspective. And from all the cases that I've seen, and I've been working with wildlife for up to 20 years, mainly with uh, varying between captive and wild carnivores and specifically a lot of lions. I run a comparison between the two and say, and I think about certain aspects saying that um, it's about mitigation of conflict between human and animals. And obviously because of the economy and the economic um, uh, benefit that people have gotten from breeding lions in captivity and all the excuses that I've received of why they do it and what the reason was from being a research facility and research breeding these animals and actually doing research on breeding lions and I clearly see how these lions actually breed well in, in the meta population, in fenced reserves and in the wild. There is no reason to be having to breed with these lions in captivity. Um, they breed really well and we've actually got contraceptive programs going with these lions out in the wild, in the meta population, fenced reserves, preventing them from breeding because they breed so well. And the excuses I got as a veterinarian is mm -hmm. that um, there's a big demand for these animals, obviously, but not in a legal manner, which everyone else can tell me better. But basically what I see from a perspective of a veterinarian dealing with these animals, and I don't really do work for um, lion breeders. I get referred cases by other veterinarians to assist with it. And the biggest issues I deal with is nutritional complications, nutritional diseases. Um, I, I, I totally agree with Louise with respect to zoonotic diseases, but there's not only the zoonotic diseases, that means the transmission of disease from animal to human, but from animal to animal. And that's the ones that I've mainly been dealing with. The, with regard to uh, diseases like canine distemper, which was a disease always in dogs and, 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 and domestic dogs and feral dogs, which now has gone over to lions in, in, in meta population wild lions. And I've seen them in captivity as well because of the incorrect and ignorant manner of the way people deal with these animals in captivity. Because first of all, it's a financial implication to work with these animals um, in the correct and optimal manner. That means giving them the correct vaccines, researching the way to give them the correct vaccines, deworming, controlling for parasites is costly effect. So um, from what I see these guys is, say they breed 50 lions and 10 of them make it, um, because they are a stronger animal and they make it through the parasites, the diseases and everything. It's still lucrative for them if they sell these animals on the black market or however the progress goes from cuddling to hunting to whatever. So, so if you're going to have to farm with a lion in captivity, there's a huge, in, in an optimal manner to get this animal to a healthy state, you're going to have to spend lots of money. First of all, they the protein that they eat is very expensive. So they're gonna try and feed them the cheapest manner. So they give them a lot of rubbish to eat. Second of all, they don't vaccinate those animals. So they don't biologically control disease. And therefore the risk of that diseases in those animals spreading to other animals is very high, specifically if they sell those animals and rotate those animals between farms. The risk of feline pan leukopenia, the risk of canine distemper, calice, herpes virus, feline, AIDS, which uh, mm. immunodeficiency virus, those are all diseases that spread amongst animals and can be and can interspecies spreading, which is starting now. We've never had this interspecies spreading uh, like canine distemper before to the extent that we're having it now. And that's because there's so little control and there's so little legislation involving um, the animal health and the animal trade in captivity as it is right now in South Africa. Therefore, Dr. I would Kudl, love... Let me ask you this question very quickly. 
you're outlining a, 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 a real doomsday scenario here. Do you feel that we're somewhere close to a tipping point here, unless this clear path, uh, which is why we all assembled here this evening, is actually agreed upon? Yes, I, I, I do think so. If I look at the health of the animals coming out of the breeding industry, they are substandard animals. They inbred. They have endless health issues. Those are animals are suffering. Every single referral case I get where um, uh, most veterinarians can't deal with, I get to see. I get sent photos, videos all the time. I am... I'm basically saying that the industry is going to crash itself because of that disease. Um, and, and these people are breeding these animals inadvertently and not spending money mm -hmm. and time on trying to do it in the proper manner by keeping these animals in a healthy, good condition. And therefore, they liberally use the word conservation and know they will be doing it. But breeders use this loosely and it's got nothing to do with conservation. Conservation is lions out in a meta population that breed and, and rotating of the lines to distribute genetics in the appropriate manner. Captain, right. Dr. No Caldwell, in the interests of uh, letting everyone get a shot in, I'm not discounting the importance of what you want to say, but I do want to move the conversation along. And uh, Dr. Duval, I want to come back to you very quickly because here is an important question from a Kelly Steele uh, who has sent it to us via Facebook. And this is how it goes. With the excellent comments made about the COVID pandemic, um, Kelly asks, do you think this would be a driving force that you could use to force this horrendous industry to its knees? In other words, Louisa, what I think she's saying is, uh, given the experience that the world has had with COVID, could this be used as a stick, perhaps, uh, as a warning stick to people to say, well, look what happens when uh, you start to get uh, the jump of diseases? Louise? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think, um, and we have um, obviously informed the minister in the high level panel of our findings as well, um, because we want to learn from the COVID situation. We don't want to be known as, um, you know, the country who brought an other uh, pandemic. And it doesn't even have to be a pandemic. It could be an epidemic within South Africa or Southern Africa. Um, we don't want to be known for that. Let's face it, it's, it's not good reputation in terms of, of, of other industries that are much more important, such as, as tourism. So, yes, I think it can be the carrot um, sort of in front of the stick, if you like. Um, I think we have to take it serious. Um, we don't really know enough about the, these diseases. And we've seen with the spillover of um, the COVID-19 virus from most likely a bat to an other, to a mammal and the spillover to humans, mm. um, these things do happen. And I think an other, uh, if I can raise that here as well, because the spin-off of the COVID-19 pandemic is actually that we've come to a point where it might actually be the best point in time talking about phasing out this industry because this industry has been hit very hard um, we've had we're into the third year of no official CITES um, export quota for lion bones we have had a year of no tourism so the tourism facilities the volunteering opportunities have been hit hugely the um, trophy hunting industry has been hit. So to some extent, the, the, the industry has been hit so hard and is on their knees. So it will we allow it to recover and then try to turn back clocks? Or are we using this opportunity where we are in a situation um, where the industry is actually making some right. changes themselves. Um, to move All right, forward. Louise, I'm going to leave it there with you. I'm going to start moving on to uh, questions from our uh, audience from around the world. And the first one, and Ian McLean, I'm going to come back to you, comes uh, or relates to that issue of uh, what I've termed incentivized compensation. This is what Lorna Harvey has to say, Ian. If the South African government banned can lion 
breeding and hunting in the country, they, I'm sure, she says, will have to compensate the farmers and pay out a lot of money. She asks, do you think this is one reason why government is stalling and not making a decision? Um, I, I, it partially, I, I think a bigger issue for, for the government has been the ramifications of a legal challenge that they lost going back um, the last time there was an attempt to curtail this industry and that was under a previous administration and the then minister was Martinez von Skalkweg. Um, so I think there are legal ramifications as well that, they, that they're concerned about. But I think um, to come back to what Peter said and what Janis said is that, in fact, everyone is saying is that um, you know, the, whatever the reasons that they, you know, may be stalling, if you're going to appoint a group of people, partners, veterinarians, um, welfare experts, economists, breeders, get them together and start developing a path forward. That's number one. Number two is they have to do an audit, Jeremy. This, no one has known for 25 years exactly what is going on on these farms and behind these high fences. They are not transparent. They're very secretive. Um, and so we... we Ian, stop. We stop. Audit to be done. Who does the audit and how do you accomplish it? Well, okay. So the audit needs to be done by the same way that the minister was able to get a high-level panel together that was uh, giving recommendations to her uh, last year about the conservation issues, about the hunting issues, about the breeding issues, and so on. She needs to now gather uh, another group of people, the experts. So Dr. Caldwell, Lizanne, pe people who represent very specifically um, what it is and what it means to close down this industry. That panel then has the full legal blessing of the government to go and do a proper audit on these properties to find out exactly how many animals, what spread they are, how many lions, how many cheetah, how many wild dogs, how many wolves, I've seen wolves, panthers, um, jaguar, everything on those properties, bears, um, and then how many of those are genetically compromised to the extent that, that Dr. Caldwell is highlighting? How many are in a reasonable state? Uh, what space is available on sanctuaries? None of this information is known. Once we, with that information in, in hand, we can then develop a very clear path forward. And I right. think government needs to do that. And then it becomes a lot easier. Okay. Dr. Jan schmidt Burbach, let me come back to you. Everyone's talking about the audit. I would suggest that doing an audit like that, certainly in this country, would be as difficult as the weapons inspectors in Iraq a decade or so ago, that there would be a lot of obfuscation, that it would be very difficult to do. As far as your concern with the bear mile um, industry, were you able to determine accurate data to inform the course of action that you took? Yeah, it's really interesting, right, to have those discussions across these issues because it's 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 always the same the same problems. A lack of transparency is it was a huge issue in the bear farming industry. Uh, in China, it remains a huge issue. We we can't access most of the bear farms, and uh, you don't you don't get access. You rely on undercover investigation and um, and get then criticized for not having a reliable data by the government who prevents you from getting that data in the first time. So. It's, um, it's really difficult. So um, access and the transparent audit is, is really the first step to understanding the issues here and would also be a first sure sign that actually there's a will to look for a phase out situation. If, if not even an audit is being agreed on or can be, can be issued, then what kind of, where, where do you want to go? So I think, I think that is really a good suggestion as a, as a first, first step to take. But let's assume that an audit is going to be immeasurably difficult to do. So you're always going to be flying blind. You're going to be dealing with data that is insufficient, surely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, however, if you even if you don't have an audit, it doesn't stop you from, from working, I guess, through other angles. It makes it more difficult to monitor and track your progress in on what you work, but it doesn't leave you a choice. I mean, just because we can't do an audit, um, in, in Chinese bears doesn't stop us from campaigning on the issue and, and still reaching out to the government and to the various groups to decrease demand and, um, and push for more transparency. I think um, it's, it would be a better and more uh, reliable starting point to have an audit, but it shouldn't be um, the end to it if, if that's not permitted. It just makes it more difficult. 
Lizanne Cornwall, what are your thoughts on an audit and how doable is it? And if it is doable, what would you be looking for? Um, it's a very difficult question. I mean, for me, auditing should in a real beautiful world not be that difficult because you've got a permitting process, but we all know that the permitting process is not really... But this issue is not about a beautiful world. It's an ugly, heinous world, isn't it? Yes. Exactly. So I would not even know where to start with auditing, but I would definitely know what to look for. And that is to help the animals in these facilities that should not be alive. To definitely make animal welfare the top priority when you do enter these facilities. And I do think that will affect your audit on the outcome of the initial numbers that's actually left to be rescued or to be relocated. Peter Caldwell, do you have a view on that? Yeah, I do. I, I'm, I've dealt with a lot of... Um with respect to um, compensation and so on. And I feel that we, we need to get government bodies involved. Um, Lazan briefly mentioned permits. I said, if they, if they can take um, a, a body like nature conservation and regulate it at a national level and get people in, as Ian said, um, that know what they're talking about to, to, to basically brief them on what to do. Like, for example, the wildlife unit of the National SPCA relating to the welfare of these animals. They, um, they come to me for consultation of, because of my experience in these animals and, and, and what should a healthy animal look like and what should they be looking for. I think that if you regulate it on a national level and get partially the government involved, which we're struggling to do right now, and get the right people involved to consult, um, and I'm more than willing to give my time for that, and it's not going to cost them a cent to be able to assist, assist these animals, then I think it could possibly work. But if you're regulating a body, a regulatory body is on a provincial level, it, it, it can't properly work. And as far as compensation goes, is you're just create, opening a whole new can of worms, you're creating a whole different industry. So I, I do not believe in compensation. The lion farmers and breeders must come on board and they must, they should have realized five years ago already that the world is against them and that it's not a viable option to breed a lion in captivity. So therefore, they should be on board relating to how we gain yeah. to remedy this situation and, and, and we should work together with everyone, with government, with the lion breeders and all of us involved right now. That's and Dr. Dr. Cal Caldwell, around the world, as people engage with you on this uh, webinar, I'm hearing a round of applause. Uh, and people are saying to me on my message screen, well done to you. But Dr. Duval, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, the reality of the situation is while this should have happened five years ago, uh, the lion breeders are not going to come on board. And to wit, uh, we extended an invitation to them to join in this important debate and we're empty chairing it. So how do you compel them? If incentivized compensation is not the solution, um, what else is there? Yeah, I, I, I don't actually, I, I agree uh, with um, Dr. Coldwell's sentiment, I, but I think compensation is something that we do have to look at. Um, it is an industry, these people have been allowed by the government to breed these animals for a long time. Industry has been allowed to grow um, because we keep talking about lions, but let's not forget about the thousands of other big cats that also are part of this industry. Lions might be the biggest group, but we've got thousands of, of, of um, uh, uh, cheetahs, uh, jaguar, um, caracals, um, uh, we've got tigers, we've got jaguars, we've got pumas. Um, We've got so many big cats, anything, including wolves, like Ian was saying earlier. Um, we've got them all in this industry. And so we're probably talking closely to maybe 15,000 big cats. Um, there might be a number that, um, that can be euthanized uh, humanely. So yes, there is, it, it's a huge industry. And I think we do have to look for a way um, to compensate those people whose animals are going to be either euthanized or going to a sanctuary or whatever the plan is going to be. So we are looking possibly at, um, you know, a massive big international funding um, 
rally where because so many people and we've got so many people from overseas actually joining us on this webinar and you know everybody's going oh this industry shouldn't exist so let's see if you know the international community will put their money where their mouth is how much and would it cost those sums we to be totally honest we have not done and i think that is where we really do need the input from the line breeding industry as well um to to see you know what what is the tipping points what kind of compensation are we talking about um so those are the fine details that really do need to be um worked out and we do need the, the line breeding industry in that mm. discussion and i do appreciate that it's it's very difficult um to be part of a discussion where we're actually talking about dismantling their industry um but this this decision may be taken out of their hands um if um the minister does decide to either stop the industry or maybe uh, limit the legality of certain uh, parts of the industry, then their hand is going to be forced. Um, so I'll, I was kind of hoping that they would want to be part of this very initial discussion on how are we going to deal with that, because we need all the stakeholders here. Mm -hmm. um, if we are talking about compensation, it's exactly those kind of questions. So what are we talking about and why? Where does that number come from? Because they can throw numbers at us, but obviously that also needs to be, um, you know, well uh, founded um, and they need to be able to explain why they believe that mm. a certain amount of compensation is due. Dr. Jan schwitt Burbach, let me come back to you. Everyone seems to be very gentlemanly here and saying, well, we've got to be all encompassing. We've got to try and include the industry in working towards a consensual decision. How difficult in your experience in Southeast Asia was it to reach out uh, to the bear farmers and, and, and to to get their cooperation. And I'm not talking about the incentivization. I'm talking about the step before that to say, we have a problem, come on board. How do we work around this together? How did you do that? Because I understand what our panel members are saying. The cynic in me says it's impossible. Yeah, um, it is it is certainly probably the one of the most challenging aspects of, of that piece of work. And it doesn't always happen as well. Um, for example, in South Korea, it, it was it was possible because the the bear farmers were sort of unionized in in some way and um, were already organized and could speak as as almost one voice. Um, and there was a certain in, uh, interest within the industry actually um, to to end it by itself. But they just felt well, the the government kind of encouraged us to get into the industry. Now we're in it. Now we get criticized for it. Um, but we invested in it already. What's our way out? And that's where the compensation came into play. Um, well, if, if you agree to really end your practice together with everybody else here, um, the government can compensate you. In other cases, um, outreach isn't as, as straightforward because the, the farm owners are not grouped and are not unionized. And then it becomes really challenging to really listen to their concerns because you do um, as Louise was saying, you do have to realize their personal investment in it. Not not all of them are in it um, because they're just evil people. Um, many of some some maybe are, but not all of them. And they have personal investment, and you do need to listen and recognize to that to find a solution that then works for them. Um, however, if if those communication channels just don't happen, then obviously um, it it might actually get worse for the for the industries as well because they might be phased out anyway, but not having been part of the solution makes the scenario much worse for them. All right. I want to start turning this conversation towards what a plan should look like and uh, maybe what the timelines uh, should be. And panel members, I'm going to ask you to start thinking about that. But uh, Lazan Cornwall, I want to come back to you and also to Dr. Caldwell, if I can. There's been a lot of talk in the past 10 minutes or so about reaching out to the industry. Um, getting them involved. You both would seem a little closer to this than others. Do you think that this is a sector that is prepared to engage, given 
as I've said, they couldn't even be bothered to participate in a in a in a in an adult conversation tonight. Liz, on to you first of all. Do you think there'd be any appetite for engagement? Um, I do think there will be a certain percentage of breeders that you can approach, um, especially now with the COVID and everybody taking a very hard knock with the loss of income. So I do feel there is some facilities that you can approach um, that you will be able to present this plan to and they will come on board. But um, there's also at least, I want to say, 70% that's going to be much harder to convince unless money is put on the let table. Let me stop you. Let, let me stop you right there. You've just said present the plan. Surely yeah. they've got to be part of the plan. You don't want to be prescriptive, surely. Uh, yes, that is very true. Um, what I mean with present the plan is you need to go with them to something. You need to sell something. You make it, need to make it sweet for them to want to be involved with. Uh, so it's going to be a very, very hard thing to do. And they will definitely, legislation will need to be on your side because a lot of these people... Um, it's a livelihood for them. It's how they earn their money. It's a business for them. Um, it's going to be a very, very hard struggle to convince mm. a lot of these people. Dr. Caldwell, what's your view? Do you think that these parties would be open to engagement? Um, these are hardcore traditional farmers that we're dealing with mostly. And it's been a hand-me-down type of thing from father, grandfather, great-grandfather, and so on. And I think presenting them with a plan, like they've been presented with very many plans in the last couple of years, is not going to do too much. It's it, it's going to be have to be 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 going to be hardcore. You're going to have to work from a government point of view and actually set down a legislation and and, and set up an act where not only animal welfare but animal rights is going to have to come into into perspective and say these are wild animals they cannot be treated like this and um, they need to be governed by legislation and not by any uh, funding solution because these guys are making millions they're selling lion bones on the black market and so on no no amount of money that you can get funded all over the world is going to change 800 or whatever farmers is mind that's not going to do the job you're going to have to fundamentally work on it from a point of view is where you have to regulate these guys from a national government level and nature conservation will have to set in strict regulations you're not going to stop it now you're not going to stop it next year you're not going to be in 10 years but as long as there is a process in place where you say that you don't give and offer permits anymore for breeding. So every single one of your animals at the end of the day will have to be sterilized because you don't have a breeding permit. All breeding permits must be revoked, reevaluated, and said, is there a demand for the animal? Is there a, a, a legal demand for the animal? No, there's not a legal demand for the animal. So therefore you cannot breed and that should be regulated on the government and that will start changing. And then those guys will come on board and say, okay, what can we do with these lines? We're not just gonna euthanize them all. Everyone has to come up with a plan and they need to start making their own plans of what they're gonna do with their lines other than breeding. And from there over 20 years time, if you sterilize or spay all these lines, they're gonna stop breeding and, and it's going to smother itself. Ian, is the solution here to choke demand? Uh, it's part of the solution. I, I think it, all, all the panelists have, have, have touched on that, and we touched on that quite a lot in the, in the previous presentation a month ago. So, yes, um, I think uh, proper awareness, education programs around this. But, again, I, yeah, I tend to also agree with Dr. Calder that, that more than anything, a strong line needs to be taken. Remember, we, we go back to what I started with. The conservation community doesn't support this. The tourism industry doesn't support this. The majority of the trophy hunting industry, Jeremy, does not support this. Um, the welfare, of course, industry doesn't support this. So we're dealing here with a very few people who are making a hell of a lot of money. Um, and no one really has actually uh, tried to address this fundamentally. And so that's what we're suggesting. If the government reaches out, there are partners out there in this audience, in this panel today, and, and many others that can help them do this. And I come back to the audit. Um, I'm, you know, the audit would be effective if government introduces the legislation and puts its weight behind the audit. If government doesn't do that, yes, we've got a problem. But it, but the audit is vital because um, in that way you get to see who is 
involved at what level, um, how long ago they've been involved, how many lines have been compromised genetically, and so on. I've been on many of these properties, um, Jeremy, in the last 25 years, in Pumalanga, Free State, Limpopo, Northwest, Eastern Cape. I can't tell you how many of these farms I've been on to. And the one thing that hasn't been mentioned here is that a lot of these guys actually are not lime farmers as their principal business. A lot of them are running maize farms or were running maize farms, cattle farms, sheep farms, all sorts of other properties as well. And they started lions because of it was lucrative and it was in a corner of their property. So in many instances, um, if the legislation comes down against them, they just go back to doing what they were doing originally. And that is providing food for the nation. Um, so uh, it's, it, yeah, it's problematic because we haven't tried to address it. Our call to government is if you put your feelers out um, and you are serious about this issue, there are many, many professional people out there, welfare, um, veterinarians, lawyers, um, you know, sanctuary owners, genuine sanctuary owners who will come together and very quickly we could come up. And, and, and yes, the industry must have a seat there. The breeders must have a seat on this as well. But it can be done. Louise, do you think government is serious about this? Given that you're still waiting for a response from the minister and Christmas was quite a time ago, wasn't mm, it? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, look, it's, it's reading between the lines or even trying to sort of um, find something in a big glass bowl at the moment because they are very tight-lipped. Uh, we have invited the minister on many occasions and she doesn't want to make any uh, public statements until she's come to a decision. The fact it's actually taking this long um, makes you wonder whether um, she wants to divert from the status quo because if she wanted to carry on with the status quo, that decision would have been pretty easy, I think. I um, don't understand what you're saying. Are you saying that she's satisfied with the status quo because it's no. a difficult decision to make and there are also livelihoods at stake in an yeah. election year, by the way? Yes, yes. Those are all considerations a politician needs to take into account. Um, and um, job creation, um, uh, employment in general, is um, for any politician an important point, um, even though the number of jobs that are, have been created in, in this industry are, are, are really quite small. Um, and direct jobs, we believe it's only about 600. Um, and I think most of those jobs will actually be retained because as Ian is saying, these guys, a lot of them are not first and foremost line farmers, but they're just farmers. So the, the people, the farm workers, they will just carry on being workers on a more traditional farming methods rather than line breeding um, and caring for these animals. So I, I don't think by curtailing this industry that we are going to lose a lot of jobs. Um, so that shouldn't be the, 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 the biggest worry for, for the minister, I think. But I'm, I'm hopeful the fact that she is taking her time to make a decision on this, that um, she is considering changes within the industry at the very least. Um, but yeah, that is just really reading between all the right. line, Jeremy. No, I understand. Um, all right. So in our remaining moments, we've got about uh, 10 minutes or so to go. Um, I want to put this to all of our panel members. What should the plan look like? What changes in legislation are needed immediately in order to start making some progress? Because what I fear is that we've had one round table conversation and um, I feel very strongly about this. I'm happy to come back for another one and uh, another one after that. But at some point, uh, you've, got to, you've got to do something about it. So, Lizan, let me start with you. What would you like to see change immediately? I think a ban on all captive breeding is the first way to go. Because if we can stop captive breeding, it means that we can control the current population that is there and not just make the problem more and more. 
And hand in hand with that, I would like to say that it should be animal welfare. As soon as captive breeding is stopped, the animal welfare audit needs to be done to help the ones that is suffering and that's not supposed to be on this earth anymore. How difficult uh, would that, uh, Lazan, be to enforce, do you think? So the minister comes out and says, well, we're going to ban captive breeding. Um, it just gets driven underground, doesn't it? Uh, yes, most likely there will be a lot of it that goes to the black market. But like we say, we need to get one foot in the door. And as soon as that foot is in the door, we can try to push more and more open until we can get that total ban in and, and spay all the females at these facilities. All right. Peter Caldwell, what would you like to see happen immediately? I think if they if they run a parallel to wildlife captive breeding as as it is with livestock and the same health plan and health requirements involved, automatically the the bad eggs will decimate on its own. So my my recommendation is to improve the animal health plan and animal uh, relating to wildlife captive breeding. How do you how do you how do you do that, uh, Peter? You, you make it as part of the, um, for example, you have um, an animal health um, part in your, in your legislation relating to how you should slaughter animals, how you should handle the meat and for human consumption and so on. So if you, you that's already an act that's available. And if you can incorporate wildlife bleeding into an improved animal health act with respect to breeding of these lions, you automatically 90% of all those lion breeders will be shut down overnight. And, and, and that's, that's already part of it. So it's not something you have to reinvent and put to anyone. You can just incorporate it into the livestock breeding act. Is that act currently well enforced to the best of your knowledge? Yes, it is very well enforced, specifically if you look at the uh, Meat Hygiene Act and so on relating to abattoirs and so on. It's very well because it's for human consumption and anything relating to human consumption and human use is very well enforced in this country. Actually, we have some of the best um, abattoirs in the world relating to anim or, um, meat hygiene. So if, if you incorporate something like that, and that's a start, it's not an immediate and clear solution, but it's a start. And you have something like that existing already. And everyone can, if they can relate eating meat and, and healthy meat to something like this, that an animal is going to be used for human consumption at the end, then, then you, you're starting somewhere. I'm not saying that's the solution, but I say it's a really good start. And from there, you can start closing down the gaps and start sterilizing like Lazan says, because I'm all for that, you know, and close them mm -hmm. down. But you've got to start somewhere. And in my opinion, this is the way to start. I'm just wondering if border enforcement uh, also needs to be ramped up. Is that one way of dealing with the issue? That, um, I mean, border enforcement is something that has always been a, a, a lack in this country and, and, and movement of these animals illegally up and down. But the, I mean, the, that, that is another point of discussion and a whole new point of discussion is that how are these guys getting these animals out here in an illegal manner? But that is all about defense, defense force. I mean, we, we don't even have our defense force looking after our heritage, which is our, li our rhinos. We don't even have our military looking after our rhinos. We have private people looking after it. So that's something we have to address at a later stage. It's a different point. I mean, now we're trying to just slow down the lion breeding. Then we're going to have to slow yeah. down the movement, illegal movement of lion products. You know, And poaching, it's like, you can make it legal. You can make selling lion products legal, but it's like you can sell a television in pick and pay legally, but you're still going to get a guy breaking in your house, stealing your TV. So that's not going to, that's not going to improve the situation. You know? All right. Um, Dr. Janschwit Burbach, what is the best practice internationally that we can adopt in South Africa to inform a workable plan? <laughs> I wish that would be that easy to say that there's a best practice scenario that can be easily adopted everywhere. I think it's, it's what I said in the beginning. I think you, you really need to find um, a local, localized solution for the situation over there. I think we heard a lot about different opinions here about what sort of mechanisms can work and may not work in South Africa and abroad. And it's really going into the nuts and, and bolts about that and identifying, okay, this might work here, this doesn't work because these guys are not talking to me. Um, 
compensation might be one of them, breeding bans, certainly from a legislative perspective, transparency of the farm situations, but also then um, demand reduction campaigns. I think we, we all mentioned it, but it's, it's important to, to really raise the importance of, of these sort of um, mechanisms, because one of the big arguments is always from the farming industry, well, if we shut down, um, demand will just go onto the wild mm. lions or uh, whatever other species you breed. Um, and while there's little arguments for it, it's, it's always important with such big industries um, to look at the demand reduction um, across borders as well. There's an interesting point that uh, Sheila Derns, one of our participants or one of our audience members uh, puts today, and I wonder if she mightn't have a point. And Ian Mickley, you can address this, then you can also give us some thoughts again on what this plan should look like. But Sheila writes very simply, can the power, and I'm going to replace her word power with the word anger of the general public be harnessed. The majority of people in the UK know nothing about this and would be horrified. Um, I'm just wondering whether your messaging, Ian, aside from the fact that, you know, Bloodlines was an astonishing piece of work, whether that doesn't need to be ramped up and amplified. Yep, Jeremy, absolutely. There's always um, more space capacity, or we always need greater capacity in terms of uh, getting the message out there, awareness. Um, but remember that you know, the other narrative has also got their messaging processes going out there as well. And so we've got to compete with that. Um, the unfortunate thing is that uh, people power... Um, at the end of the day, can force an agenda onto a government or a set of a group of politicians. But, um, you know, that has got to be coherent and, and strong enough. And, 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 and as I say, in a, in a coherent can't, way. Can't, can't be driven by emotion. It's got to be driven by data. Correct. Yeah, so exactly. And so I think one of, one of the bloodlines, is, one of our approaches has always been to work with the recognized conservation community, to work with the recognized tourism industry, to work with the, the, the trophy hunting industry. Um, you know, we were very effective in the beginning working with the ethical and responsive, responsible hunters, both here and internationally. Um, so, yeah, the messaging is a very, very important part, and it can play a role in getting uh, an issue on an agenda. But ultimately, it's going to be driven by the, the specialists. So the likes of, of the recognized conservation community, the recognized veterinarians, the sanctuaries of the world, you know, the, the work that Dr. Schmidt Bobach is doing, um, that ultimately is, is what we need. And so I come back to what would I like to see? As, I, as, as um, Lizanne has said, um, I think number one, and I think Dr. Caldwell said so as well, is stop all breeding. The conservation community uh, has spoken to that very clearly. There is no conservation value. So stop the breeding. Then we have a timeline on the issue. Um, 12 to 15 years. That's what we have to deal with. Um, and then I, I, my next call would be for, the, for, the, for a group to come together to do the audit. Because until we have an audit, we, it's difficult to plan uh, an effective strategy if we don't know exactly how, what we're dealing with. And, and then I would, I would then go, go from there. And the lawyers must be involved, actually. I mean, there's some great constitutional lawyers, um, some great animal rights, welfare lawyers uh, in this country and around the world. They should be involved as well. Dr. Louise Duval, I'm going to give you the final word. You're the campaign wow. manager and director of Bloodlines. Um, again, I hope that we've got a little bit more, uh, if you don't mind the, uh, the metaphor, a little bit more flesh on the bones of this particular debate. Um, where to now? What's the next step? I think the next step is because we all agree, I think, that first and foremost, we need to stop the breeding. So I think what we need is a moratorium from the minister. The minister can do that. It's in her power to put a moratorium in, like she did on a leopard uh, um, trophy hunting, for example. So the minister needs to come on board. We need to have the political will to actually push this forward and to put a moratorium on the breeding in this industry. 
I think that is the start. We can all say, you know, we need to stop the breeding. And I fully agree. It's the first step. But we need the political will. The minister has to put that moratorium in place. Um, and and then, of course, enforcement is, is an important issue. But that is where we need to start. And I'm actually appealing to anybody within the captive line breeding industry who are listening in here, because we do want to talk to all stakeholders within this industry. We want to come up with a plan that works for everybody. And so, yeah, that is that is so important. If I may also, because I think Dr. Coldwell made such a good point as well, there are no norms and standards on welfare, on the keeping, the breeding, the slaughter of these animals in our country. Um, there are some norms and standards, but those have been put in place by an industry body that only represents a very small number of the total, about 10% of all the breeding facilities in this country. So they represent only a very small number of members. Um, the Department of Agriculture is looking at updating their Animal Protection Act. That is where we need to have a foot in the door. We need to have, involvement in those kind of processes mm -hmm. that we can actually start to get proper legislation into place to protect these animals in captivity. Mm -hmm. So I think there it's a long road to go, Jeremy. Um, as, as Jan was saying earlier, there's no silver bullets. Um, but I think that moratorium on the breeding of captive predators is the very first step that we need to get. So Minister Barbara Creasy, if you're listening, um, please, um, you know, that would be the very first step to make. And then we can start devising a, a phase out program because also it's not going to be an overnight situation either. It's going to take a pretty long time. Um, we need to put a time limit on that whole phase out plan, but it's not something that's going to happen overnight. Um, so, yeah, I think that is, um, and certainly the people out there, the support, the pressure that people can put on government is incredibly important too. Um, it would be my suggestion, it would be my suggestion, um, Louise, uh, that uh, those people who have been watching today and who are concerned about it, uh, there's nothing to stop you from contacting the minister yourself, because you say that this is going to be a long road. But uh, the reality is, as Peter Caldwell pointed out, we're at a nexus. We're at a precipice now. We don't have time as far as this particular issue is concerned. Um, I look forward to uh, your blueprint on what is coming out. Um, as I said at the beginning of this conversation, um, a high-level panel that was put together by the Minister of the Environment, Barbara Creasy, um, relating to um, canned lion hunting, has made recommendations. Uh, Christmas 2020, we still await the Minister's decision on these recommendations. Uh, the clock is ticking as far as that is concerned. To all of our panel members, uh, Peter Caldwell, Dr. Jan Schmidt-Burbach, Lizanne Cornwall, Ian Mickler, Louise Duval, Thank you very much uh, for joining us today to our audience in South Africa, on the continent of Africa and around the world. Thank you for participating and for the comments and the questions that we were able to use. And I bid you from Johannesburg, farewell. Thank you. Thank you.